it, it's kind of like I kind of want people to undo uh, the magic that is being done on them through doing magic for themselves in their own life and to challenge the world around them. You know, there's a chapter in my book called You Are the Illuminati, and it's my favorite chapter in the book because it's about um, undoing yourself from the current cultural climate that some people would um, describe as like a collapse of Western civilization in a way. Welcome to the Cosmic Keys podcast. This is going to be your episode for February 17th to the 23rd, 2020. And today we have a really fun discussion with Alex Kazemi. So Alex is the author of a book which is coming out this Tuesday. It's called Pop Magic. And we have a really fun discussion about working magic, different styles of working magic, and his success with magic and it's a really fun chat we get into some of the details on how to compose spells how magic really works so you're going to want to stay tuned for that discussion but before we get into that we have to do our forecast for this week and we had a pretty big card last week so we had the world card and that was our first time getting the world card so i Hope that you all took some time to think about how that card fit into your life this week. Um, So, Dan, did you have any world card experiences? So, it's kind of interesting. I had kind of a difficult-ish week where I was kind of like low energy and sort of um, frustrated with a lot of stuff. And it was sort of uneventful. But how, how can I say the world card appeared I'm going to go out on a limb and say the fact that, you know, last minute Alex's uh, agent reached out to us to do the interview and I was like, yeah, let's do it. Then I started reading his book and learned more about Alex and the fact that he's like well connected to like so many other things. I feel like I feel weirdly that the fact that we got to do this interview was my world card because it definitely kind of changed my uh, perspective on this show and spiritual stuff. Um, so I'm going to say the fact that we talked with Alex is my world card. What about you? Yeah, I'm kind of agreeing with you on that. Um, in our conversation with Alex, we talked about how he really did some amazing magic where he got to um, interact with and speak with some celebrities and he, you know, does some name dropping. Like he, you know, did some candle magic and talked to Marilyn Manson on his phone, <laughs> which is like crazy. That's some, that's some world card intense stuff right there. Um, so yeah, I kind of agree with you that the, the kind of random occurrence of having the publicist reach out to us and, and getting that interview done right away seemed like a, a really kind of world card moment. Yeah, well, he said he did so, magic to land our interview, so I feel like we were just touched by someone else's magic, and even um, just like to be totally frank with our listeners, like it's it's kind of hard to keep, it's hard to keep a podcast going strong. And before we got, had that interview lined up, I had some, I was like, crap, like we're falling behind. And then all of a sudden we have this momentum and now I feel like we're ahead of the game. So I feel like uh, it was just like a good end of the week for the podcast in general. Yeah, yeah, I really think so. So yeah, that was a good, good card helping to carry us through. So we are coming up now on a new week so we got to pull a new card are you ready for it yes let's see what we get Ooh, ten of wands again oh geez i already feel this one again we got this not too long ago right oh last week could have been a ten of wands honestly i feel like it's been a ten of wands like month in a weird way Yeah, you know, it really has uh, for me as well. So the Ten of Wands, it shows a figure. He's holding all Ten of Wands in his arms. And the way he's holding them is obscuring his face. He's kind of leaning forward and walking. And it's pretty clear that this is not sustainable. He's going to trip and fall and drop everything at any moment. So this is the card that really represents overwhelm 
and taking on too much at once, too many responsibilities. And gosh, this card is relates to our day-to-day lives in this contemporary society in so many ways that I'm not surprised it shows up a lot. Um, especially like my own personality, I'm always the type to say yes to anything that comes my way. <laughs> so I often feel like the Ten of Wands where it's like, oh crap, I took on too many projects at the same time. <laughs> oh no, I'm going to fail because I can't possibly do all of this in this time scale. So that's what the Ten of Wands is really about. It really represents you needing to start saying no to certain things. Start delegating some of your responsibilities because if you try and take on everything, all these tasks, all these projects all at once, everything is going to collapse and you're going to be exhausted. Um, So a really practical, real world card, something that I think many of us deal with. What are your thoughts on this one, Dan? Well, it's so interesting. We got this two weeks ago with the world card in between. And it's interesting. The last time we got this card, um, I don't think I was aware of me doing that Ten of Wands stuff. But then this past week, I had no energy. like, Because I'm in the lifestyle where my day job requires physical labor. And I'm in between doing a podcast, doing music and art stuff, playing at bars, and then also snowboarding (laughs) all the time. So my body just gets so worn out. And then, so I had a very like low energy, unproductive week last week. And by the end of this week, I'm so frustrated. I'm like, I need to do everything. I need to like seize the moment, seize the day. I need, and I'm, maybe this is yet another warning. Like, Hey, chill out you're gonna overdo it you're gonna burn yourself out relax because literally even last night i was like all right time to be time to like do everything because last week i didn't i didn't get a a whole lot done and was frustrated by that so yet another warning it seems like yeah so for our listeners you know try and take it easy as much as possible in this next week and be confident enough to say no sometimes because we really can't take it all on at once. Um, but how is our astrology? We have some kind of crazy stuff coming up, don't we? Well, we're coming off a very active Sunday. This previous Sunday, February 16th, we had Mars, action planet, kind of very Ten of Wands, entered Capricorn. Capricorn is where the South Node, Jupiter, Saturn, and Pluto are all hanging out. Mars is in that territory now. So for the next six months, or sorry, the next six weeks, you know, our energy and our drive is going to be in this Capricorn territory amongst all these other very powerful planets. So maybe off the bat, the Ten of Wands is a sign that, you know, don't overdo it with Mars in this region now. And and also another thing is Mercury just stationed retrograde on Sunday. So um, we're in Mercury retrograde for the next few weeks in Pisces. We have to adjust to that energy, which is also, you know, very ripe for miscommunication because Mercury is in its detriment in the sign of Pisces. However, you know, I I tend to like Mercury in Pisces. Pisces is my fifth house, which is a, a creative, pleasure-filled house. And even last year, Mercury was in Pisces retrograde, and I I kind of enjoyed that too. So don't automatically freak out about this Mercury retrograde in Pisces, but be aware that <laughs> Pisces is a a region of the zodiac where things can be certainly miscommunicated. So. Now that we've covered Sunday, let's get into this week starting on Monday the 17th. It's President's Day. The moon will be in Sagittarius on Monday. Um, Moving into Tuesday is a big day. Tuesday, the sun leaves Aquarius and enters Pisces. So along with Mercury retrograde in Pisces and Neptune in Pisces, we now have the sun in that area. We're in Pisces season. Pisces season is the last the mutable sign of water it's the end of the astrological calendar with aries spring equinox being the first 
you know, the day one of the astrological new year. We're at the end of the astrological new year, and Pisces is ruled by Jupiter, very spiritual, very dissolving, very empathic, emotional, and creative. Some of the, I mean, honestly, some of the, all my friends that are Pisces are uh, very artistic, very creative, very spiritual, very special people. So we are in that time of the year now. Um, Also on Tuesday, the moon will leave Sagittarius and enter Capricorn. Um, Be aware that anytime the moon is in Capricorn, it it is going to be coming up close to all these other planets like Mars, the South Node, Jupiter, Saturn, Pluto. So from Tuesday until Thursday, be aware of your emotions being affected by these things and scarlet your your natal moon is in capricorn so you might be feeling this Mm -hmm. especially and it's in the 10th house in your case which is your career house so we'll see how that's affecting all of the things that you're doing with your career at the moment you're doing a lot um oh great i'll have to get ready for it (laughs) (laughs) um a, a very special alignment is happening on thursday so um thursday Thursday morning, you know, we've been feeling this for a while because these are, we're talking about two kind of outer planets. So on Thursday morning at 10 56 AM, Jupiter in Capricorn will sextile Neptune in Pisces. So this has been building for a while because the, these planets move slowly. Um, Jupiter being the planet like these are Jupiter is a spiritual planet of sort of religion philosophy and Neptune is a spiritual planet of like the psyche the dream world um the other world and when Jupiter interacts with Neptune in an easy sextile this opens the doors for opportunity of spiritual things in my opinion of expansion in your spiritual life in insights in your spiritual life you know, throughout 2019, Jupiter was in Sagittarius and Jupiter was squaring Neptune. So we can compare, you know, the squares of 2019 might have caused confusion or tension or issues in 2020. Now that Jupiter is one sign over in Capricorn, that causes a sextile rather than a square. So this is the first hit of three um, because Jupiter will go retrograde, hit it again as a sextile, then go direct and hit it again as a sextile. So I say make Thursday, Jupiter's day, a a spiritual day and um, an introspective day and an optimistic day to sort of chase your dreams. Friday, so um, also on Thursday, the moon will leave Capricorn and enter Aquarius. So this is a super balsamic moon. Um, we have the new moon coming up Sunday in Pisces. So this is like the last sliver of the balsamic moon from the Aquarius lunar cycle. So definitely, you know, in general for this entire week, wrap things up, wrap up your projects. You know, when we're thinking about the Ten of Wands card, you know, rather than overdoing it and starting new things and forcing new things, why don't we try to wrap things up and um, end things before the new moon kicks? Um, so Friday, the 21st, with the moon in Aquarius, we have Mars now in Capricorn, an Earth sign, trining Uranus, which is in the Earth sign of Taurus. So Mars is in early Capricorn. Uranus is in early Taurus, and this is a flowing, harmonious trine where these Earth energies blend between these two planets. And with Mars being your drive, your energy, your ambition, your willpower, and Uranus being the explosive, radical changer that shakes things up and energizes and radicalizes things this is going to be like energy out the wazoo in an earth, you know, in earth. Mars is exalted in Capricorn and, you know, Uranus and Taurus. This is going to shake things up, but possibly in a good way. 
So think about your energy levels on Friday and also think about our card because if you have you know, an excess amount of energy, you don't want to turn into the Ten of Wands card and use Mars too much. So just be aware of that as it's all going down. And then as we move on to the weekend and to Saturday... We have another thing happening with Uranus, with the sun sextiling Uranus. So this weekend is going to be kind of high energy in Uranian in general. Um, Whereas Friday was your energy levels being sort of shocked by Uranus and amped up by Uranus. Then on Saturday, your sense of identity will also go through that change as well. So be open to change this weekend for sure. Um, and then, you know, it's, it's, we're embracing change in the early days and then boom, Sunday we have the new moon. So it's kind of like with sun, with the new moon being the new beginning on Sunday, um, maybe this upcoming weekend can bring a lot of change, which can be a good thing. So new moon occurring in the sign of Pisces at 10 32 AM Eastern on Sunday morning. Um, This is going to be our new lunar cycle now that we're in Pisces season. Um, Set your intentions in the, you know, look at what house Pisces is in 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 your chart and try to set an intention that is related to to that. Um, Sunday, you know, the moon before, before going new, the moon in Pisces will also sextile Uranus too. So I'm seeing this weekend as like, embrace the change and shift your life around as Uranus shakes things up Um, and then set that intention in the Pisces themes and finally the last thing to mention of this week happening on Sunday at 11 59 a.m love planet Venus will square Jupiter so this is um you know a square is a hard aspect it can cause tension and shake-ups so be aware of what's going on in your relationship life on Sunday and be aware of overkill because Jupiter expands. You don't want to all of a sudden be like overly obsessed about relationship issues or too too much energy, too much love energy because Jupiter blows stuff up. Um, and with... Uh, with this happening on Sunday during the new moon, just, you know, they're the two benefic planets. So it could manifest in a positive way, very likely, but just don't overkill. And with our card again, the warning is don't overdo it. So that does it for the week, you know, first week of Pisces season. And, um, this month is flying by much faster than January, I would say. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Time does really seem to be flying by this month. And it is it is neat kind of how the astrology is reflecting that Ten of Wands in a lot of ways. And I think you said it as the main theme, don't overdo it this week. <laughs> that seems to be the term for both the card and, and the astrology. Um, so, so, yeah, I mean, it's a good message. We'll, we'll try and live it out in our day-to-day life. And Um, We'll have to hear from you guys, too. Be sure to uh, send us a message or comment on Instagram because we want to hear how these cards and the astrology is is reflecting in your own life as well. And stay tuned because we have a really fun interview coming up with Alex. Cosmic Keys podcast, we are speaking with Alex Kazemi, 
and he is the author of a new book, which is coming out this Tuesday, February 18th, and his book is titled Pop Magic, A Simple Guide to Bending Your Reality. So in this book, he shares a great introduction on how people can really harness their power that lives inside them to really kind of unlock their creative potential with magic. So we are really excited to have Alex on today to talk all about spells and magic and manifesting our best reality. So thanks for coming on our show, Alex. How are you doing today? I'm doing so good. I'm so happy to be here. I love what you guys are doing with the podcast and it's really a great opportunity to be in this space with you guys today. Yeah, we're super excited to be chatting as well. And when I got a copy of uh, your new book that's about to be released, I was I mean, off the bat, I was like, even in the all the all the names of people that gave this book praise were really impressive, like George Nori, um, Ariel Pink, Marilyn Manson. Like, so I off the bat, I was really interested in your background and your bio, and that's usually where we start the show off, anyways. So, to get started. Um, Give us a little information about your early life. Like, where were you raised and were you raised with religion at all? Well, I was raised in BC, in Canada, and I was raised in, you know, just a typical kind of suburban neighborhood. Religion was a part of my my life in, in early childhood. The spirituality that I was introduced to was Greek Orthodox, and no one ever kind of showed me any other options than kind of dogma and op- oppression and i i kind of internalized that in my my teen years and 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 i was i was frustrated because i i had found myself in a kind of nihilistic um apathetic type type of place as a teenager where i didn't have much spirituality so i reached out to a lot of external light and you know through i guess things that would qualified that would make you addicted and I, I kind of struggled with addiction in, in my teen years for for that reason and um yeah I I kind of actually I don't blame but I think a lot of that started from a lack of having a spirituality that I that I couldn't connect to and and not a spirituality that I could connect to and when I discovered magic it, it was a place that was non-dogmatic non-discriminatory and it was kind of like the spirituality that reconciled um all of my favorite things that i i loved about um not my childhood but like the just the idea of life being a magical place you know like i get to wake up every day and 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 check the moon transits and there's different energies and i get to do these spells where where things that i want to happen happen and and there's just so much beauty to that that I didn't experience with Christianity. Um, and uh, it was it was difficult for that reason. Yeah. And I'm curious, too, on like around what age should you kind of start to discover magic? Because I started researching that kind of stuff when I was like a young teen and it really kind of paved the way for for my adolescence and eventual adulthood. And Um, I'm curious about when did you start kind of researching this kind of stuff? Well, that's super cool that you got to have that like in your early teens and like, like, and have it during, like, did you have it in high school? Yeah. So I started reading about Wicca um, when I was 13, 14 or so. So yeah, it was part of, you know, my teenage years, Uh, (laughs) you know, had a little coven with some of my friends from school Um, So, but yeah, I mean, not everyone does kind of start learning about this stuff at that age. Dan didn't start getting into um, these kinds of topics till later on. So, so what about you? When did you first start to get interested in magic? Well, um, I started to get interested in magic when I turned 21 years old and a spirit came to me and was like, you need to start researching witchcraft like this is and I was like what the fuck is happening you know it was just it was just like a a, a visitation and and it was really scary because I had all these astrology books that said the cusp of magic which I was which is what I'm born on corresponds with the age of 21 and uh, I don't I just 
it just felt like I was in a weird witch movie where like my powers were about to awaken. And I kind of, when I, when I had done that research and I was just like, I was like, Oh my God, like, this is it. Like, this is what I want. Like, this is the answer to everything it is right here is, is the fact that I can, you know, access this, the upper worlds that I can and visualize and to, to create the life that I want and, and have a connection to something past the material world. It was so exciting. And I remember buying like the Raymond Buckland book and Scott Cunningham and just diving right in and really, really getting really excited about that. And from there, you know, obviously it, it took me to some really powerful places and I think that started with maybe that desperation of, of needing that spirituality. But now that I think about it, I think maybe it came to me when I was ready for it. Cause maybe like how you said, you know, I had um, magic in, in high school. Like I was very an emotionally impulsive, volatile type person as a teenager, you know, like what if I had done magic that wouldn't have been good for me at that time in my life, you know? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I want, I'm curious too, Alex, <clears throat> Um, to backtrack a little bit, you mentioned your you were raised Greek Orthodox, um, and when I think of that religious tradition, I mean, unlike like Protestantism, which has no iconography or anything, like, do you think that the iconography and sort of like the very old school ritualistic aspect of that religion? sort of primed you to do magic because I mean, I was raised Catholic myself and a part of me is like, if I wasn't raised that way, would I have been this ritualistic by nature? So what are your thoughts on your Greek Orthodox uh, heritage that, and background? That's so, that, yeah, that's so interesting to think about because I also always thinking about that because I'm like, you know, subconsciously what, like, what what did fascinate me when I went to church? Like I like I guess the iconography on the on the uh, you know in the church, but also you know the candle lighting, you know, and and the ritualistic elements also, I guess, did kind of subconsciously plant a seed to to making me kind of loop back to this to this place. And and weird enough, I'm I've been very very as of now interested in Kabbalah and deep into it. And I, I kind of thought of the, what you had just said, like how, how do I say this? Like people who start out with that kind of religion, like Catholicism or Christianity, you know, I kind of find myself weirdly going back to a kind of order out of the chaos, you know, and, and, and enjoying like a discipline at, not dogmatic, but kind of finding salvation in that, if that makes sense. Yeah, I totally get that. I think there's something very powerful about the ritual aspect of magic, and that can come across in very different ways, whether it's like ceremonial magic from like spells or like a Wicca tradition versus like a Greek Orthodox ritual. I mean, there's so much that's the same about those two types of things where you have, um, you know, the, the movements, the intention setting, you know, prayer yeah. is, is really the same. It's just like how much stuff you have. I always think of like witchcraft as it's just prayer with like more fun tools. Well, um, but yeah, there's a lot of similarities that. there, like underneath, I think that are really interesting. Yeah, no, I completely agree with you on that. And the thing, the thing that I, what you start to learn when you study the history of magic and what magic is, it, it really is all spiritualities, all religion is rooted in this, you know, stripped to the bone, cut to the core practice of magic, you know. Um, and I think for how, when you, when you, in, when you do magic and, and you, because you we're taught to pray for, for things to just come to us. But when you do magic, you get an input by sitting there, directing your energy, you know, actually putting some work in for what you want to materialize. And, you know, you can work with gods and goddesses and angels and entities, but, you know, it, it's different than the way that we're taught how to materialize things through just please God help me. You know, it, it's kind of more of an accountability 
and 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 there's more there's more work to it than that yeah it's i mean by using tools and props and stuff i mean it it's really just like getting more into the quote unquote prayer anyways cuz that's i mean prayer is magic but if if it's like this big performance you're really focused on it and it really works better when and and especially when it feels like there's something actually on the line like you're sort of risking something by maybe getting what you wish for so i find that all really interesting oh wow yeah you know so so you like the idea of like spirits setting up trials for you to get to your goal through the magic you know it's interesting i i you did bring that up in your book and um <laughs> I guess I I always have in my own experience have thought about like the hard stuff or the the crazy unexpected monkey's paw be careful what you wish for thing um but I guess I never thought of it, thought about it the way you framed it where it's like your guides or these um spirits are actually sort of like your coaches or tr- are like testing you but really in my experience that makes a lot of sense cuz I feel like be entering into the occult realms is a huge test and a lot of people like really screw it up and shouldn't do it but it is a test for sure (laughs) yeah no no that no no that that i mean yeah there's there's definitely an abuse of magic out there and the abuse of the practice and obviously it's their free will to abuse it but a lot of people don't um a lot of people don't understand how powerful it is. And and I actually think what I've learned about the people who stay away from magic, they're, they actually are the opposite of the p- kind of people who get off on like reordering the cosmoses. Like they are reordering the planets to their will or their destiny. They're actually afraid of that. They want natural order only. They don't want any influence. But I think when you do magic, it's a the people, who are doing magic it's a part of your natural order to do those type of spells like in my own life i've seen that happen a lot you know um like i talk about in the book like the spell i i used to manifest marilyn manson into my life like that was very much magic you know and that was one of the first spells i ever did wow that's amazing that that's one of like the first spells that you did can you tell us more about that particular spell like what kind of spell was it so I kind of had discovered when I had discovered magic, I was like, okay, you know what? Like, if we're really going to do this, we're really going to do this. Like I'm, I, if I can get anything that I want, if I could have no limits to my beliefs, if I could really bend and switch reality up, let's just do this because Manson was someone I really like looked up to as a child and as a teenager and just was someone I found a lot of intellectual camaraderie with, even though I didn't know him. And I just felt a lot of connection to him, like isolated, alienated type kids do. And I was just like, you know, I, I, I kind of actually put the intention that he would help me also. So I got a black candle cause he's a Capricorn and that corresponds with Capricorn. And I did a, I just, you know, I just manifested the feeling that it would feel like if he would be in my life or if he would help me and, I don't know if I had a specific end result yet. I kind of was just so desperate and I put a lot of emotion to it and neediness. And I just, I just really, really begged the universe universe for it. And then weird enough, two weeks like later after I did the spell, you know, a lot of people would be like, Oh, well, you know, you're just in the situation where like someone could meet him and introduce you or something like that. And I'm like, no, 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 no. If I hadn't had done that magic, that person would have never been there at that right time. You know, it wouldn't just have it. It wouldn't have had happened. So basically what happened was uh, a friend had went to a party and, and she had met Manson and was like, guess what? I, I met Manson. It was like, and I, I don't know. I don't know if like something took over me, but I was just like, give me his number now. Give it to me. You know, I was just like, give it. Like I was just so ready, you know, I was like so willed, so ambitious. Like, and also I had studied how like Marilyn Manson acted in the earlier days in his career and he was a lot like that like he strategically interviewed Trent Reznor when he was a journalist to try to get Trent to get him on his label you know like so I kind of was like you know what maybe he'll see something in me so I ended up um doing this so yeah I I got the number and it was I was in my kitchen and I was like okay I'm gonna do another spell 
which I don't, I wouldn't recommend doing spells twice, but I was like, I'm going to just do another spell. And I visualized the feeling of him texting me back and, and just like that, it, that the magic worked. And then, so I went into my bedroom and I was like, okay, I'm going to bed. And I guess I, I, at the time I didn't understand how magic worked. I thought it would be kind of like instant. So I was like, fuck this magic doesn't work. I'm going to bed. You know, like I was just in a bad mood. And then my, my notification went off and then I, got out of bed and I go into the kitchen and I look down at my phone and it's like, Hey, it's Manson. Sorry. I've been with Johnny Depp. Like what's up? And I was like, Holy fuck. Like this is it. Like Matt, I'm doing magic forever. Like goodbye to everything. I'm only like, I'm making this the focus of my life. I was like, this is going to change my life. And obviously there were so many trials like before I could even like get something locked down with Manson and he's very haunted and very paranormal and magical himself and really weird stuff happened. But yeah, that, that was probably my craziest life changing magic story, you know? And to this day, like he gave me a blurb for the back of my book, you know, like that's insane to me. Yeah, that's awesome. And I think, uh, you know, in your book, you the way you the way you frame things in your book is very like like having the desire and having the emotion behind these visualizations is sort of the fuel to the magic and everything and um i total like i noticed that sometimes even if you don't do an actual ritual if you are hell bent and excited and just enthused about something that's sort of like natural magic that peep that happens to everybody all the time. Cause I really feel like, um, the enthusiasm and the emotion is, is really key. And that's sort of the whole premise of your book. And that's, what's really cool about your book is, um, you sort of frame it that like anybody can do this so long as they can tap into those inner states. Yeah, no, you're, you're exactly right. Like, like emotion is the, master key to magic because emotion can be alchemized into energy you know your all of your emotions are energies that you can alchemize so it kind of upsets me that we live in a culture that is like you know numb yourself you know avoid your emotions distract yourself from your emotions but you're throwing out very potent magical valuable energy that can be transmuted and um i'm sure that society doesn't want us to know that because because emotion is, you're exactly right. Like it, your will to want it. You know, you think of someone like Madonna who said on MTV before she was famous, I want to rule the world. Well, she did it, you know, because she she had that will to, to want to do it. So a lot of us kind of talk a big game, a big magic pregame where we're like, yeah, you know, like I'm going to do all this stuff and, you know, the kind of ego cocky stuff. But it's really about, you know, actually showing up for it. The kind of magic that I'm kind of advocating for is like a Herculean magic where you actually show up for it when the trials come. You can't like sit on Reddit and read a chaos magic PDF and when shit goes wrong in your life, not actually you know, do this magic and do this alchemy and and have that will and that belief because life in itself has violent vi violence. You know, nature can be violent, and I think magic um, is is kind of taking us back to that pagan connection to the chaos of of of, of nature and being alive, but also the soul's will to bring order to it. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I think that makes a lot of sense, and. One of the things that I find difficult when I'm doing magic or doing spell work is getting myself into that intense emotional state <laughs> because you're right that like society just tries to kind of numb us down to everything that immediately we try and like downplay or say like, oh, you know, it's not going to work or, you know, whatever. So really kind of drumming up my own energy is something like I really try and work on because you're right. I think it's all about that emotion. That's the key. And it's interesting too, because we are tapping into the, into the chaos of the universe and kind of manipulating <laughs> the world for our benefit here. And that's where you get that like fine line, which a good magical practitioner will know how to walk the fine line, but it, you can fall off it, you know, too. Oh, it can get dark. hundred percent. 100%. You're exact, exactly right. And maybe 
Maybe because you're an air sign and air signs are known to kind of think their feelings, you know, their emotions kind of exist in the abstract, like, and in their mind, you know, it might be harder for you to kind of potently access those things somatically that, you know, maybe someone with more water in their chart could do that. But I, I definitely think if you practice, you can get better at, at, at moving those blocks, you know, because air, air, air can be a tricky element in that way. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. I'm the type of person that like, it's very difficult to make me angry. <laughs> Libras and that's love like the peace. Libra. Yeah, Libras love peace. So you're but you're right, though, when it comes to spell work, it works best when you're like insanely passionate or even insanely angry at something or emotional or or a bit of a wreck, you know? Yeah, exactly. I always think of that scene in, in Mean Girls where Regina George like runs to her burn book. I always think of that as like a kind of alchemy, you know, if someone had grabbed, grabbed a candle, you know, instead of that, you know, instead of, you know, plotting revenge in, in that way. But like you see how she, in that scene, she's in such a charged up state of like rage and emotion. But if she had that soul's will to, you know, maybe alchemize that into you know her being better or doing better as a person rather than plotting this egoic kind of scorpio revenge i i I always think that's like interesting how these high emotional states that we get in can completely be the battery to our magic and i think um it's just about getting to be more conscious about that and recognizing it does that make sense yeah yeah definitely (laughs) that totally makes a lot of sense well in in the book Pop Magic, and this is what this is why the title Pop Magic is so appropriate. I mean, one of the first like techniques that you sort of go into in order to raise these emotions is to just like play your favorite music and sort of like dance and get into like a trance like heightened state. And honestly, like I just within like a month and a half ago, I basically moved from Chicago to Breckenridge, Colorado. And I was using that technique for a full month because it it was so hopeless. I thought I was so trapped at home, but I had this like pump up song and I literally moved and visualized and got the feeling of Breckenridge going and I'm here now. And I, I really attest it to that. But in your book, I think you talk about how like a Selena Gomez song is like your sort of like pump up. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. See, that was that. Okay. Well, first off, I'm really happy that, you know, the feeling of living inside of one of your spells, you you know, you know, you're on the other end of it. It's the coolest feeling ever. That's the the best, most rewarding feeling of magic is when you, you, because essentially you've been where you are right now in, in past tense, you know, you were there when you did the spell and you believed in yourself and now you're here, you know? And I think that's, that's really, that's really great. I mean, yeah, so that that Selena song with you know Max Martin production really um, did was my was my full moon song, but because I put it in the book, I felt like um, I felt like I felt vulnerable because I was like you know magic is so private, and I just exposed that you know I need to I need to switch the song, but yeah, Selena Selena hands to myself was was the song, and and like you like any big pregame song for you, whatever makes you feel magical feelings you know it could be ray of light by madonna you know something like that like any pop song that just gets you going or a guilty pleasure that just makes you feel good use that to to spin around to you know you don't have to do peyote or ash you know all the drugs you know you can just open open the altered state of consciousness with pop music and i think i think uh, i'm really happy that you recognize that part in the book yeah, well, somebody's once asked me too. They're like, if you could have, like, if you were a baseball player, what would be the song that they would play as you approach the bat or whatever? And I'm like, okay, yeah, you do need those like, like very personal songs that just get your heart beat up and get you, give you goosebumps. And I mean, that's how you tap into that emotional. Uh, energy it's it's really crazy just to think about the power of music in general exactly and also the you know you know sometimes if i can't very i'm a water sign you know i'm always you know it's like an emotional tap that doesn't ever stop but um but uh the the if sometimes i have to actually access memories and 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 feelings to in that i remember somatically to 
um, bring into the ritual to, to, to get me going, you know, even memories can help looking at old pictures, you know, nostalgia, whatever, anything that elicits a strong emotional response can then become energy and then become a part of, of your ritual and, and be a potent aid to your ritual. Yeah, that makes sense. I'm going to start listening to like summer pop jams from the 90s <laughs> next time. No, <Nope. laughs> do base. some magic love to try it out. <laughs> Listen yeah. to Love Fool. Yeah, why not? If we're trying to tap into that nostalgia and like get really like pumped up, you know? And another thing that comes to mind too is just like dancing in general is such a good way to like get in the mood, get that energy up. And, you know, people have been using music and dance. Uh, you know, for ritual, you know, and magic for forever. I mean, this is some of the oldest forms of magic is really just music and dance. So it makes a lot of sense that it would be such an integral part to our modern day spell casting. Yeah, exactly. And also, um, that's also used that that um, vulnerability to the those emotional reactions is also used against us by corporations and pop culture, you know, the bait and switch about pop magic is is that it's kind of like a saccharine um, fantasy, but when you open up the book, you know it, it leads you into at its surface, it's it's something that you think it's going to be, but when you read the book, it's different. It, it's a trap door to bring you into this world of you know um, occult magic and alchemical tools that can change your life. You know, I kind of wanted to create a kind of pop spectacle around how people could be attracted to this project with, you know, the names on it and the people mentioned in the book and all of this kind of stuff. It's meant to kind of bring you into the, a more meaningful world. But um, yeah, I, I also kind of want people to feel a little concerned for me. And it, it, at, by the end of the book, why, why did I care so much about pop culture and getting approval from these people and, and pop stars, because I believe that, you know, we're, we're all divine and, you know, the separatist comparative, comparative approval addiction culture um, is, is all is, is toxic, you know? And I, and I think um, I am happy to say that, you know, I'm very self-aware of that now, but I, I kind of wanted to fall. I wanted the book to also follow um, my own experiences with like approval addiction in working in the fashion music industry. Yeah, I I really um when I think about the word pop, you know, pop is really powerful because I mean, pop means popular and I mean, it really is the, the thing that connects so many different types of people and it's kind of like it can be used as a dirty word, but I mean, even in Chicago there was a a Warhol exhibit that was there for a while and I mean, he was making like art for the masses and even just like the bright, like instant gratification, like s indulgence of pop is super powerful. So applying that to magic kind of just makes it more powerful magic in, in my opinion. Exactly. And, and also it, it makes you aware of the pop magic all around you. You know what I mean? Um, I, I've i worked in this industry. I, I've seen that people plan releases around the moon phases. You know, I see that there's a lot of occultism around our world and in our movies and on, you know, commercials and advertising and, and, and everywhere. And, and, you know, repetition in itself is a kind of magic. And if you think of how people become famous, it's repetition. You know, why do we know who Ariana Grande is? Because it was constantly repeated to us in our subconscious mind and planted that we we discovered who she was because people kept talking about her, you know? And um, it, it's kind of like, I kind of want people to undo uh, the magic that is being done on them through doing magic for, for them, for themselves in their own, own life and to challenge the world around them. You know, there's a chapter in my book called You Are the Illuminati. And it's my favorite chapter in the book because it's about um, undoing yourself from the current cultural climate that some people would um, describe as like a collapse of Western civilization in a way. Yeah, it is really interesting thinking about the term pop and pop art and pop music and how it relates to magic. Because 
you know, when you're thinking about pop songs, they they do stick in your head. There is something kind of magical about that in and of itself. But even the lyrics, when we think about popular spells, they always have rhymes to them. You know, so pop music, when you're if you're listening to pop music and you're performing a spell, it's got that kind of rhythmic, uh, rhyming quality to it in a way. And then pop art too and magic. I kind of think like, you know, we, we can definitely hate on Instagram or whatever, but it really is like modern pop art in a lot of ways. Oh, it is. It is. I mean, Camille Paglia would, would say that Rihanna's Instagram is one of the greatest works of art in, 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 in our in our modern time, you know? So there's definitely a, 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 a pop art. And what's interesting about in- Instagram is it, it, um, it made everyone access the feelings of, of fame and, and celebrity and, and kind of tap into, into that. And we've all kind of entered this celebrity democracy and, you know, where we have these micro realities that exist where, you know, some person could be like a 10 million follower, f- have 10 million followers on Instagram and be an influencer. But, you know, I could walk down the street and say that person's name and they might not know who that is, you know, because there we live in these micro weird realities. But what you said also that pop, pop music is a form of chanting and, and raising the energy and, and magic and it's and it's being put inside of our heads you know and it's not always for the good either you know there's also a lot of negative energies that are emitting from these corporations and from the internet and and social media and 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 all this stuff and it's kind of like why why is it an endless feed you know because they want us to be addicted to it also yeah i sometimes think about logos of famous brands and how their logo is kind of a sigil (laughs) in a lot of ways and in a way they're also kind of like egregores because you know people have been putting all this intense emotion on that logo for so many years so they do have power really these kind of corporate logos in a lot of ways Um, especially if you even connect them to something like that also happens to be a cult like the Starbucks mermaid, for example, then you get into some like really kind of (laughs) crazy, you know, put my tinfoil hat on ideas about kind of how um, corporations might be using these tools and using sigils in a purposeful way. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. I completely agree with you. Yeah, all logos are our sigils. And they're programmed to make us act a certain way or respond to them in a certain way, for sure. Yeah, so I guess kind of doing pop magic is a way for us to kind of fight back. Yes, exactly. <laughs> against that. That's 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 a big point of the book is let's fight back, let's take back our power. I mean, it's a very um it's a very it's a book about self-protection also, you know. I feel like our energy is trying to be held hostage by so many things, you know, our energy is being so hijacked by corporations, notifications, you know, everything and I think you you start to feel drained. People feel their energy drained. And if you have no energy, well, you, you can't do your magic. You can't manifest the life that you want for yourself. Yeah, definitely. It's the, the thing too, which I found really interesting in your book, you know, is just your, your involvement with these things, with fashion, with music, like all the names you were dropping, even Camille Paglia, like, these are like, it seems like you have a lot of cool connections. And could you just kind of clarify, I guess, your career path, you know, as you were getting involved in magic? Like, because I'm like, you're like an, you're a, an artist, but your resume seems very diverse. And I just, I was kind of curious, like, what was your career path? Well, yeah, see, I I kind of I started I dropped out of high school to start working in the fashion industry when I was 15. So from there I started to write for blogs and you know just I just kept climbing and kept hustling, you know, just every day I I was just very disciplined to work and I I've been an editor at UK magazines and European fashion magazines and all this kind of stuff, but you're right. It was a bit of an evolution. Like I was a blogger, then I was a, a a journalist and then I was an editor. And then I started to, my art started to be featured on these blogs. And I think at the whole, at the core, I always wanted to be an artist, but it was kind of like that kind of thing where I was not 
aware of that yet. So my way of, of kind of getting myself in the industry was to immerse myself around other artists and people who I could interview and talk to. And, you know, a lot of the time I'm, I'm kind of happy now that I've, I've figured out what I, what I want to do, but yeah, I've been a, you know, I've produced fashion covers. I've, you know, done interviews. I've, um, been a journalist, you know, all this, all this kind of stuff. I, I mean, as an editor, I had a lot of responsibilities, you know, I, I edited King, King Kong magazine. Um, and I did like so many covers and yeah, I, I just, it's just, it's just something that kind of happened, but it started to get as crazy as what you, you, as you described when I started to do magic, like that was when I could manifest all these people into my life was when I willed them to be in it, you know? Yeah, it's so appropriate too because I mean, the people that can climb that ladder are often accused of just oh, you just got lucky. Like you just ran, you just met the per- right person at the right time, and then you got lucky. It's like if that. I mean, if you if you're doing magic, that that's there's no such thing. Yeah, I know, and that's why I was I explicitly said in the beginning of the book, there's no such thing as a coincidence, only magic. And it really fucking pissed me off that it took so long for me for for that to be out there because I didn't see that in any other magic books that I read. It was like this needs to be explicitly said because I've said it with witches and witches have said it to me, and I'm like, we need to put this somewhere, you know. And I'm happy that you also have you have that understanding. Also, yeah, I mean, when you're will deep willed and and ambitious you know, a lot of people will try to tear you down from, from wanting your dreams. You know, they'll also plant seeds in your head too. You know, um, the black magic that is happening is usually from the negative thoughts of all the people around you who put limited beliefs and, and, and send you back to that wounded child programming to get to kind of detour you, you know, a lot of people subconsciously and not some people subconsciously unconsciously sabotage others because they see that someone who is into magic and, and has a blind belief in a soul's will could be like a threat to their dreams and or their unmanifested dreams. Yeah, we. It, it just gets me thinking. This theme keeps coming up that, you know, as people reach success, like I feel like success, part of the package of success is having actual haters, <laughs> and like if you don't have haters, have you even reached success? So. And it, it's it's like haters are real and their influence is real. And even in my case, like even just that knowledge can take a while. And if you're really empathetic and sensitive, you're like you're like, oh, I don't want them to. I don't want them to be upset. I don't. I don't. I don't want them to feel negative. But it's like managing haters is extremely key. I feel like. Well, yeah. And I, I faced like a lot of doors slamming in my face, a lot of rejection, a lot of dark people who consciously, I know for a fact would try to sabotage me in really calculated, manipulative ways. Like I, I faced entities and dark people and and demons to even be here talking to you guys right now. And a part of how I react to rejection now is I just kind of, I don't even I identify with, I I don't even have really an emotional reaction. And that's kind of something that you can practice for yourself, like on the astral plane, you know, you can, part of Kabbalah is like visualizing how you're going to react to things. And the tree of life is visualizing how you're going to act, react to things that you, um, that could go wrong and how you're going to handle it. And if you're calm and you keep going, you'll get to where you want to go. But so many people, like if they, they get that one rejection. They think that it has something to do with them. It doesn't. There's a million variations of that person out there, that gatekeeper. And, you know, one of those people or maybe a hundred of those people will approve of you and you just have to go out there to find them. Yeah, I, I think you're totally right there. If you fixate on rejection or these bad experiences, it's just going to like blossom into something really negative that's going to kind of drag you down overall. It also makes me think of how I find it really fascinating that a lot of paranormal events happen when people are ex- experiencing depression or something really traumatic has gone on in their lives. So it's I almost wonder, you know, in those circumstances, if because people are, you know, acting a certain way after these negative experiences, they're like creating their own <laughs> 
fears into a reality. So they're manifesting those fears. Oh, yeah, 100%. You're exact, you're ex you are exactly right. I actually know this for a fact because when I was kind of deeper into um, kind of darker states and, and depression and, and destructive states, um, that's when I would get all the visitations of, of, the, of the entities. That's when the sleep paralysis would come because I was giving them food to to live off of me at that point that's that's what they want is they they want to match to that lower vibration that lower spirit and um they and exactly what you said if people around you are trying to inflict those states in you by putting their negative thinking into you well guess what the it's just going to be a kind of negative demonic chaos so you kind of have to treat life like a bit of a, a video game where you're dodging chaos, negative people, like cutting bad people out of your life is a positive thing, you know, but I know empathetic people also, you know, kind of stick to, you know, more darker people to, you know, give all of their energy to, and we attract psychic vampires and all that stuff. And, but, you know, it's okay to set boundaries with people. It's a hundred percent. Okay. Yeah. I, I totally agree. And um, I can relate to what you were saying about um, sleep paralysis. Like <clears throat> that was a big problem. <laughs> that was a big issue for me for a while. And it totally coincided with not only like depression, but just like tension, like t a tense resistance of to change, I guess. And I mean, knock on wood, I haven't dealt with that in years, but um, I totally agree that like whatever is on the other, whatever's happening on the other side and in, in the imaginal world, in the dream world, in the astral realm, like that negative stuff is very real. And it's, it's interesting. I don't know if it's like an, I think it's like a helpful step in people that are working with magic to go through those trials. But, um, I think, yeah, now that I haven't been in that type of state in years, I haven't dealt with any type of that paranormal sleep paralysis stuff in years either. Yeah, I, I think that that makes makes a well, you know, the way we learn about things like sleep paralysis is by sharing these experiences with each other, you know, how we could, you know, match up the fact that you went through a similar thing that I did. And because some people are like, oh, sleep paralysis is, is all psychological. It's not a paranormal phenomena. And I'm like, no, I don't really think so. Because we, we as magical practitioners and, and people who are open to the spirit world, and it, we, we pin together these theories because that's what makes practicing magic so fascinating is we don't know how it works. There's no fixed fact. It's just we know that it does work and we do it because it works, but we also know that, you know, we have no idea how any of this works at the same time. You know, it's just a strange, I think that's what keeps us fascinated by it is because we don't understand how it works. Right. And there's really no one rule book. It's kind of like trying different techniques and seeing what works best, which makes it fun, but it can also be frustrating and scary for anyone who might be new to magic. I'm curious if you've ever had any, um, negative experiences with spell work or magic where um, like a spell rebounded on you in a negative yes. way or or anything like yeah, that. Yeah. So um, early days, I there was a girl that I had a, a crush on and I was younger. So I was like, you know, red, I'm going to grab a red candle and a sex magic spell, you know, and I was like, and called on goddess, you know, who obviously knew this was the wrong thing to do. But um, I was just young and stupid. And I, I was just trying to figure out how to how to do this stuff. And I like, yeah, I got the threefold, you know, I choked on a chicken bristle, <laughs> and like, <laughs> almost like, choked. Um, I kind of got I got hit by a car, but not like really badly, like just like a little bit. And um, when I went to the doctor's the the clinic that the the doctor that was in at the clinic was wearing like a witch necklace like which was even weirder and um yeah i think the third thing was i almost like 
set my house on fire or something, you know? So there was like, you know, I, I, and then I've also gotten things that I've wanted where, uh, I actually after felt, okay, was that worth it for what had happened? You know, like, like a lot of people were emotionally hurt in that process and, I was so in my own ego and in my own magic and my own desire for the end result. I was like, Hmm, this is strange, you know, like, and that's why I think it's actually okay to say things like harm to none, even though that is very wicked and, and witchy, but um, yeah, I've definitely had bad experiences with magic. Like um, I've gotten really sick after one time I made a sigil with someone whose energy I don't think was exactly right. And um I, I started throwing up and, and all this stuff. So I think um, magic really physically affects us. And I'm not trying to make anyone afraid of it, but just like understand this is the unknown, you know, and, and it's not going to always be this saccharine positive like thing, you know, it's not, it's not like a magic isn't very new age, you know, it's like, it's a, it's a, it's a universe that you're opening up yourself up to and you're, 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 you're bending reality. And that's kind of where I kind of get a little confused because like, you know, in Hercules, right. When like Hades is like always wanting to like rearrange the cosmos to like get Hercules. Do you guys know Disney's Hercules? Yeah. Yeah. I I think there's so (laughs) many lessons about magic and alchemy in in that movie. And um, you know, Hades is so egotistical, so obsessed with instant gratification, so impatient so jealous so rageful and his kind of magic is so dark but hercules who kind of cares about other people is empathetic you know works hard has divine will self-discipline and all this stuff he ends up coming on top in the end but hades keeps failing with his kind of egoic magic because the ego is you know our enemy. And if we're doing magic to feed our ego, we're feeding demons also, I think. I think that's what I've learned myself because I think the most powerful magic that you can do is is receiving light and receiving your manifestations so you can share them. And that should be your intention behind your magic as well. Because if you're just doing, but but also I want people to manifest their perfect uh, image of success and and dream life so that they can realize it's not the answer and then go to that next level of um, of doing the soul work and, and doing the self work and doing the shadow work and really clearing things out. I think that's when the real magic starts. Yeah. And I found too, in like my own practice, for me, one of the biggest benefits of working with magic is like you kind of said, it's just kind of coming to the realization <laughs> that you know, we can let go of our ego a little bit or just kind of in the moment when you're doing magic, feeling connected to the universe or feeling connected to nature in a way that really takes us out of the day-to-day mundane life. I found that to be like really powerful for me. Like magic is just part of my wider like spiritual practice or even religious practice since I'm a pagan, you know? So Yeah, no, no, of, um, of, of course. That's been so rewarding. It's just kind of making magic help me reconnect with yeah, the universe and the world. There's no, no, there's no ecstasy other than, you know, visualizing white light while you have a white candle, you know, like that feeling of just connecting to energy and the divine and the universe and the upper worlds. It's just so powerful, like you just said. Yeah, I think... Well, the thing that I liked most about your book is, you know, the emphasis, the type of magic you describe is not particularly like too advanced or too technical where you need to like read this huge tome to understand it, but it really focuses on the inner state that you cultivate to charge the magic. And I always feel like, as you know, to be frank, as someone who's tried a few things out here and there. I feel like if you're in that really egoic, like I will wield power, power, like I am strong. I'm a a mat, like me, me, me. That's actually, I mean, you can build that state up and get in full like psycho mode, but that, and then like, you have to ask yourself, is this what I want to cultivate every day? Or do you want to cultivate just that like goosebumps, like high vibe, like dancing in your room, 
good vibe that if you felt like this 24 seven, the world would be a better place to those around you. So I think in discerning between good and bad magic, you could be like, if I was like this all day, would it be a good thing or a bad thing? It's, it's kind of simple. Wow. Yeah, exactly. You know, I've been in that exact state that you're talking about and what I had realized about that state that you just talked about of ego, I call it the mental throne. And um, I realized anyone who can plug into that mental throne, doesn't matter if you're the president, a pop star, or, you know, just anyone sitting in their room, you're just plugging into that mental throne. And that's all it's going to ever be. It's always going to be a kind of playing make-believe. Even when you have the material things and you are those things and you can identify with it, you're, if you choose to uh, to attain those things just to plug into the mental throne and be a power junkie, well, guess what? You know, you're not a very spiritual person if you think you are because you're just really just plugging into the fantasy of, of your ego and you're isolating yourself from so much more magic and so much more experiences. I understand that some of us need to go through that and we need to um, feel those things. And I want people to feel powerful. You should want to feel powerful, but I don't think feeling powerful means being better than others. Whereas a lot of um, like aristocracy and, you know, hierarchy and all that kind of stuff encourages us, you know, I have to be the best. I have to be the best. I have to be the best, but you know, you can be your best. You can be your only opponent. You know what I mean? You can, you can make yourself your own competition and, and, and not have that, you know, Scorpio vendetta revengeful energy against people but rather channel that somewhere because you know I have a lot of Scorpio in my chart and I've I've seen that side of me and if those you know that energy could have been alchemized for my own good and my own will rather than trying to prove something to people trying to prove revenge to people um I could have manifested a lot more during that time. I understand I had to go through that, but, and it was coming from a place of feeling very weak, but um, I, I agree with you, you know, that, that ego mental throne feeling is, is kind of, it can be kind of psychopathic. <laughs> it's, 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 if you charge yourself into that state, cause you can very much will yourself into that place and you can feel it also. Yeah, I, I definitely see a lot of people online who kind of talk the whole like, oh, you know, magic, I'm a living god, I can use magic to like, <laughs> to to control the world, and I'm going to show you how. But I like how your perspective on this is, is quite different that, you know, we're trying to attain the things we want in life, but do so from a position that isn't so ego focused, and use magic in a way to really kind of connect back in with spirit, with the energy in the world. And another thing that I really love about your book too, I find it very approachable, especially for anyone who um, hasn't really played with magic too much, but really wants to give it a try and that it's very like doable. These are like things that anyone can do. Like candle magic is such a wonderful thing because all you need is a candle. And I feel like some people, when they're starting out, probably get overwhelmed with thinking like, oh, I need all these ritual tools and I need all this stuff. And then they just have anxiety over that and don't actually do any magic. <laughs> so I love how attainable the stuff in your book is. It's like perfect for anyone who just wants to like get down and start working. Um, so yeah, I really appreciate that perspective that you have in your book. Wow, you're a hundred and million percent psychic because you know that those are literally my intentions said back to me exactly that i i thought of the young kid who wants to get into magic but they're so overwhelmed they don't know where to start there's all this you know people walking around in thelema robes you know all this crazy stuff it's like where do i go go from here and i wanted to create this place that would be like hey this is this practical book that we can all get and pass around to our friends. And, and, and this will teach us how to do magic because I've read all of these occult books and they barely get down to the point of doing magic. And, and it didn't, it, or it's usually deep in there or bloated or 
confused or, and I just wanted this kind of uniformative clinical way of explaining alchemy and magic because I created the book that I wanted to exist. You know, if I, if it had already existed, well then you know what, I wouldn't have written it. But the reason I pushed so hard to get published and all, all of this, you know, everything that's attached to the project is for the possibility of, you know, one day being like a place here to talk about this stuff and helping others because I do believe that this is a powerful thing that a powerful device and a powerful tool that can change your life. And if you don't, you know, if you're skeptical of it, what I like about the book is at least the skeptic will leave knowing what people who do magic do. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I find it so fascinating too, that, you know, it seems like more and more young people today are starting to get interested in magic and spell work and, you know, religions like Wicca, it seems like there is this wide yearning <laughs> among young people to to explore these topics that um, they might have been too shy or timid about doing, you know, 10, 20 years ago. So I'm really excited to see that Gen Z in particular seems to be enamored with magic and trying this stuff out. And I think overall, it's going to become more of a thing in in our contemporary society. So um, I'm excited to see what happens. I mean, do you see anything um, shift and change since when you were young and like young people nowadays? Oh yeah, 100%. I mean, like the TikTok kids, they're on another level. Like I don't even, I can't even, you know, I watch those TikTok compilations and I'm like, wow, like what world, like, like this is a different reality. You know, I, I think, you know, Gen Z has an interest in magic, but I think the popular, I, I think the reason we see an interest in magic is because of the spiritual poverty that we what we live in in our culture. Um, how we are 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 taught to connect, but these things are only making us more disconnected. And if you think of, you know, all of the external things that we try to reach out to, we're really just trying to find a place of spirituality, a place of magic, you know? So if these kids and, and people can have magic first, maybe that way they can they can see the, that instant gratification, instant pleasure, you know, these transient things aren't going to fulfill them externally, but, you know, accessing that light within or accessing, you know, the fulfilling light from the upper worlds that can go right into your soul is, is a different experience. And I would hope then, then, the things that, um, you know, that a lot of young people reach out to, to feel a sense of spirituality. I think a lot of our culture is an attempt to reach a spiritual place. You know, the person who's going on a Tinder hookup is trying to re re reach a spiritual place through, through sex, you know, to feel good, you know, to reach a sense of relaxing or, or spirituality or the YouTube girl who wants to be YouTube famous, you know, she's trying to gain a sense of power and love, you know, but magic can, can provide these things for you. And, and so can gods and goddesses and angels and, and spirits. You can, you can create those attachment styles with the upper world. Yeah. I, it's interesting when you were talking about um, just your book in general and how this type of book hasn't really been made yet. Like when I was reading it, I was like, Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Like over and over again. And I was like, this, it just feels like this current of like simple, basic manifestation work, simple ritual, simple order out of chaos. I mean, we've all kind of been talking about this as just a normal thing for a while, but has I, have I ever seen it laid out in a book this way? Definitely not. And especially with like examples of successes or failures and connections to all these famous people it's just like huh I, I don't think this has been made before so I hope it reaches like I don't know I hope it reaches people that were maybe hesitant at first because it is very approachable like we were saying that's that's very interesting how you guys are, are saying the word approachable because I think I think a lot of, of people you're exactly right like people 
kind of think of people who do magic as as weird or or occult or strange, which is kind of like what you know the occult community likes. They like to feel that identity, but this stuff is for all of us. And and I, I exactly wanted that kind of you know world where you know when someone's watching like an empty when when people are watching TV or like uh, an event that everyone's looking at, like maybe there could be a magical reference talked about or you know where. Or or astrology, like I'm so happy astrology has made such a big wave in the cultural discourse right now because it's important for us as people to to um, recognize as a universal consciousness, you know, these transits and 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 our charts and and there's so much knowledge in your astrological chart and there's like every everything about myself that I've dealt with or any destructive trait is in my chart and. I don't care if um, you can look at it from both ways. You can look at it from like a Carl Jungian way of like, okay, we're going to use Leo to organize these negative traits about yourself. And then you can, you know, master yourself or from a metaphysical point of way where, oh, wow. Like when you were born, your birth chart, like literally created your identity. It's your soul's DNA and, and your soul evolution, which I obviously am a part of that belief system of the metaphysical and astrology. Yeah, and I think more and more people are opening up to these ideas. As you said, there's kind of this real lack of spiritual connection in our modern life. So that in part is why I think astrology has become so popular. People are just really searching for something. And it almost seems like the world's dividing between people who are... um, just completely, you know, atheist or or materialistic, and then people who are kind of the spiritual seekers, and who are willing to try out new things, whether that's magic or something else, you know, they're really just kind of open to exploring spirituality and, and how that can benefit their own personal life. So I see that continuing to expand and and we see it in pop culture, you know, all the time, like I just finished the newest season of Sabrina that was on Netflix. So that was fun. And it's, it's, I'm always happy to see when witchcraft and, and spell work and magic appears in popular culture. Cause it reminds me that, you know, people still love this stuff and they're going to forever and people find it meaningful and, and find that it brings their life something a little extra special. So, so yeah, I mean, I'm really excited about that and where we're headed in the world. Yeah. I actually <laughs> kind of thought about that, like that, like what you just said that this stuff is always going to be powerful and a tool because I was like, Oh, like, you know, if anything ever happened to me, like I left behind like a book that, that could help people, you know what I mean? Like I, I, at least I, there's, there's a place where I am understood and um, there's, there's tools that will always be associated with me and my desire to help people, which is the most cancer thing that I've ever said in my life. But um <laughs> <laughs> that that but yeah just like yeah and i think that's why i i wanted so many iconic people to be associated with the project because i wanted it to be like having like a artifact of pop culture history or something yeah one thing that um you kind of go over in the book a little bit but maybe for our audience you could clarify um if you were to <laughs> try to articulate like your theory about how magic actually works, how would you frame that? Like, what is your metaphysical worldview that allows space for magic to exist? Well, see, that was one of my favorite chapters that I also wrote because that wasn't in any books. I was like, why isn't there a chapter? I think it's the chapter, chapter, um, how how the fuck do you know when magic works? Um, Right, yeah, that's what I I was referencing. Yeah. 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 So that chapter. um, So I go back and forth. Okay. So I think I'm fully, fully in belief that it's spirits and entities that can materialize and, and, and kind of plant these rearranging codes to our realities. And, and when we do magic, we're accessing them. Um, I have, at one point tried to believe in the psychological point that I was just doing self-hypnosis and self-mesmerism. And that's why 
uh, spells were working because, you know, I could do a spell to, you know, a willpower spell and then to kind of like I, I went to the gym for 170 days straight and I was doing willpower spells and oh, um, some people would say, yeah. And some people would say, um, oh, okay. You know, that's just your will that that's your soul. But I think, you know, it was a part of magic and, and, and me visualizing me seeing that 170 day thing on my habit tracker, you know, I, I think like that's also a part of it, but um. Hmm. It's kind of confusing because, so what would you say? Like, what would you say? Like, how do you, why, what do you, cause there's a few theories about, about it. There's the one about how, um, like we said, the entities, uh, manifesting things for us or, yeah, I think that's the one that I, I believe in the most now that I'm thinking about it. I think that's the one or, I think that these things are meant to happen and you're meant to do the spells and, and just energy will rearrange or the universe. I don't know. What do you, what would you guys say from your own experiences? Well, I kind of, in a weird way, I sort of believe in, I sort of believe that consciousness, like the big C consciousness is more fundamental than this physical world and that like above or on top of the physical world it's all mind so and and energy and like an emotional energy and um will and uh, just like meaning you know i feel like meaning comes first and then emanates down into this world so that's kind of a kabbalistic perspective that like above us is like um yes, as above so, so below yeah as above so below so i think there's just this vast unseen world that we are always connected to through consciousness but like it seems kind of goofy to just like play act a ritual and it's all in your head and then you it, it seems crazy to expect that that would emanate down and cause effects but i just think that yeah, mind is everything, so that's how magic works. And yeah, all no, the no, all I the specifics of that, I have no freaking clue how to like organize it it's all. It's so hard to articulate. Yeah, yeah, no. I just think mind so, is, is so, more so fundamental. Confusing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like our consciousness, like like when you think positive thoughts, you create positive energies or positive entities to match with, and miracles happen, and 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 all and all of that stuff. Um, have you have you studied Kabbalah at all, or? Yeah, I have, um, kind of. I mean, the main book that I read was by um, Dion Fortune, and I liked the way she framed it because she kind of connected the Sephirot to, like, um, planets that are in astrology or, like, pagan deities or archangels, just things that are sort of more easy to, to relate to than, say, the super Jewish style where it's, like, I didn't, I'm not a rabbi, so I don't quite understand, but she kind of brought it into like more of a Western way of seeing it. But yeah, like tree of life consciousness. I, I agree with you. Like I think, think Kabbalah is the most advanced form of magic. And I think it's the most powerful form of magic. If anyone, you know, manifested my, their dream life by using my book, what I would say is the next level would be to discover Kabbalah because I think it's, it's the most powerful form of magic. Like the idea of restricting instant gratification to fulfill your future self. And, and, and the fact that you gain more every time you restrict instant gratification, I've seen that work in my life. I think it's a powerful form of magic and I love the Sephiroth as well. Yeah, and Kabbalah is integrated in so many different magical systems too. So like it's in everywhere in tarot. <laughs> so it's it's everywhere in so many different aspects of the occult studies. So yeah, I, I agree that Kabbalah is fascinating. And it's something I've been beginning to learn more about too in my own personal journey. Um, but yeah, I'm kind of like with both of you on the concept of magic where I, I think it's like, uh, several different factors at play all at once. <laughs> and 
speaking of which, um, why don't you tell our listeners where they'll be able to find your book because it comes out on yeah. Tuesday. Um, wherever books are sold, you can you can get it on Barnes and Nobles in America. You could get it in chapters. You can get it um, online on Amazon, Simon and Schuster dot com. You can get it where wherever book wherever books are sold. You can you can buy the book and hopefully you'll start to see it in your local metaphysical stores doing a lot of magic to, to make that happen. But um, yeah, I, I, yeah, you can, you can get it. And uh, an audio book should be coming soon as well for people who use audible. Yeah. That, That's awesome. Yes. And um, is there, are you on social media or do you have a website for our listeners no. to look you up? I don't have any social media. I don't want, I don't ever want a social media account. Um, I think Hopefully, I don't know if it will be up. I would say popmagic.com is coming soon. Oh my God, is this 1999? Um, uh, but uh, um, yeah, I, I don't, I kind of just don't exist in in the world of like social media. I guess there's my website with just my name.com. But um, I don't, I don't like social media at all. Um, and I don't use it and I avoid it. I think it's, it's not good for me particularly and my own chart. Um, and my sensitivities is just not something that I use that's productive, but other people can handle it. So I don't, I'm not hating on people who use it or anything. It's just not, it's not for me, you know? Yeah, that's really cool. I mean, that's really, that is going against the grain these days. And um, I guess you guys, to our listeners, just need to get the book yourselves and learn all these things that we're talking about here. <laughs> Thank you again for coming on our show today. I feel like this is a really fun conversation and I think our listeners are going to really enjoy it. Awesome. Thank you. Happy Mercury Retrograde, everybody. I just want everybody to know that I spent hours editing this episode this Sunday and then right at the end right before literally minutes before Mercury stationed retrograde the whole thing got deleted and I had to start all over and now you can hear more Mercury retrograde in this in the way I in, in 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 the way I'm talking right now. Last week the problem was that it was making me sound like a chipmunk, and this week it's a problem where it's in slow motion. And the program I use is Audacity, and honestly, I have no freaking clue how to fix it, and I'm too lazy to do anything else. But follow us on Patreon, follow us on social media, Instagram, Twitter, the whole thing. And best of luck in surviving this Mercury Retrograde. And have a great week.